Hi, thanks for listening. Uh, I'm going to talk about exploration by optimization and partial monitoring, and this is joint work with Chapa Sebeshvari. So let me start by refreshing your memory about partial monitoring. So you have k actions, d outcomes, and m signals. And this is a sequential game uh, like a banded problem. So at the start of the game, you're given these two matrices, the loss matrix and the signal matrix. And both of them have dimensions, the number of actions by the number of, of signals, of outcomes. And you're given these at the start of the game. Okay? And then what happens is the adversary is going to secretly choose a sequence of outcomes. So this is the oblivious adversarial setting. And, and then in each round, you choose an action. And the environment is going to give you a feedback, which depends on the action and the outcome chosen by the adversary. And then just going you know, to look that up in the signal matrix, right? So the feedback that you get is this phi of AT, XTs. And, and the main point here is you don't get to observe the reward. You don't get to observe XT. I should say loss. Sorry. And <clears throat> as is normal in banded problems, your goal is to minimize the regret, which is measuring the difference between the expected sum of the losses that you get and the sum of the losses of the best single action in hindsight. So we want to make the regrets small. And, and the really important point here is unlike in bandits or full information problems, here you don't get to observe your own loss, right? You just get to observe the signals. So you know the loss matrix and the signal matrix. So you hope that somehow they're connected and you can figure out some way at least of estimating the losses from the signals. So this is, this is partial monitoring. And, and the main result that's been proven over around a decade or so is that the minimax regret, so that's the worst case regret, depending on the, the, the matrices, um, falls into one of four categories. So either you have trivial games, so that's where the learner can figure out from the very beginning which action is optimal and just play that action. And then there are sort of two interesting categories. There's the so-called locally observable games and the globally observable games, where you either get square root regret or into the two-thirds regret. And more or less the defining characteristic of games which are globally observable but not locally observable is when the learner has to play some sort of informative action to figure out which of two other actions are optimal. Then it can pay a big price for, for doing that. Whereas if you think about a banded game and you're trying to figure out which of two actions are optimal, you're just going to play those two actions. And so if they're close, it's hard to figure out which one is better, but the price you pay is less. Uh, whereas in a globally observable game, you might have to pay a big price often to figure out which of two other comes are better. Okay, uh, so this is all nailed down, uh, but the problem is there are multiple different algorithms, and these big notations hide constants that are arbitrarily large. You know, they sort of depend on the, the game matrices, the loss matrix and the signal matrix, um, but even for fixed K or fixed number of outcomes and whatnot, these constants can, can be arbitrarily large. And these algorithms are just like are quite complicated. They're a little bit hard to tune. Um, it's a little bit hard to gain intuition about what's really important from these algorithms. And we want to, we want to improve, improve this situation. So basically, the plan is really simple. So we want to combine exponential weights, uh, this, this well-known tool which we, we love, and uh, and we're going to add some exploration in a clever way. So exponential weights by itself, we'll see in a sec, isn't, isn't good enough. But if we're careful, then we can, we can sort of fix it. And we're going to use this, this fact, which is almost a definition, really, which is that for globally observable games, there is some function that you can use to estimate loss differences. Okay, so this, this, this is displayed equation is just saying that if I, if I played all the actions, essentially, then I could estimate the difference between the losses of actions B and C. So you actually can't necessarily always estimate the losses themselves, but you can estimate the differences. And that's what's important to make it possible to get sublinear regret at all, essentially. And well, if you're familiar with uh, partial monitoring, you know this non-degenerate. If you're not, then, uh, then don't worry about it. You can look in the paper. <clears throat> all right. So we need a couple of facts about exponential weights. So first of all, I, I I expect we all know this equation. So you have a, a set of loss estimates. So L hat S A is going to be an estimate of the loss of action A in round S. Usually they're going to be unbiased, at least up to some sort of shift. 
And if they are unbiased, up to up to a shift. So basically you're estimating differences. So you can add something, subtract something as long as you do it from all the estimates. If that is the case, then you have a regret bound, um, which depends on the learning rate. It depends on the the diameter of the probability simplex with respect to the neg entropy. So that's this log k. And then it depends on a term which is sometimes called the stability term, sometimes called the variance term. And that basically measures the variance of your loss estimates. Right, so this is the definition of the size, this this exponential business, uh, which can also be written as a Bregman divergence. But if you take a Taylor series expansion, then you get that it's just approximately equal to uh, a variance calculation. Okay, so this is called the, the stability term. And the regret of the algorithm, not very surprisingly, depends on how much variance there is in the loss estimates. Right, so the usual plan is to construct a clever way of estimating the losses which makes this stability term small. And then you tune the eater at the end of the day, and that's what gives you your bound. Okay, so, so this is what we're going to use. Um, and the important thing to think about here is exponential weights just accepts as a, a function the, the loss estimates and a learning rate. And, and so when you're sampling from an exponential weights distribution, that algorithm is not really looking at the information structure of, of the game that you're playing at all. Right? So if an algorithm, if, a, if an action has a small loss, it's going to be played. If an action has a large loss, it's not going to be played, or with any low probability. And, and so in games where the, the action with a large loss is the only action that's informative, you don't expect exponential weights to do well. <clears throat> and that's what we're going to see. So here's a very simple game. So we have the two matrices. So this is a three-action game, two-outcome game. So you can think the learner is playing along the rows and the adversary is choosing the columns. And what you can see is that the first two rows of the feedback matrix are totally uninformative, right? Uh, you just get the same signal no matter what the adversary does, so you can't tell the difference. So you have to play the third action to gain information. But if you run exponential weights on this problem, well, it's going to play all the actions for a little bit at first, uh, but then it's going to quickly learn that the third action is suboptimal. And then it just stops exploring, basically. It plays the third action with very low probability. And, and at that point, if it hasn't figured out which of the first two actions are optimal, which might be quite hard because they could be really close, then it's just going to suffer linear regret. And, and so exponential weights really is, is no good by itself uh, for this problem. It only cares about the losses. It doesn't have a concept of information. And, and so this algorithm that we're going to propose for partial monitoring is, is fixing this this, this problem. All right, so the algorithm has basically four steps. Right? So the first step is going to be computing an exponential weights distribution with the estimates of the losses that it's obtained so far. And then the, the most important step is it's going to solve an optimization problem to find two things. The first thing it's going to find is a distribution PT over the action, so that's what it's going to sample from. And then it's going to find also a a loss estimation function. So this is a function mapping actions and signals to vectors, right? So it gets the action that it played, the, the signal that it observed, and then a vector that it's going to estimate. And the optimization problem has two parts. So the first part is uh, a, a loss relative to QT. So it's the price it plays relative to the exponential weights distribution in the worst case. So everything is maxed over the set of outcomes that the adversary could choose. And the second term is literally just the expected stability term of exponential weights. So we're going to minimize our regret relative to exponential weights plus a term which encourages us to choose a distribution which makes our estimation effective of low variance. And then we sample our action from that distribution, we observe a signal, and, and we use our loss estimation function to, to estimate the loss. And that should be weighted by PTAT, so it divides by PTAT. All right, so the main theorem is, is this very simple bound on the regret, which is the regret is smaller than log k divided by the learning rate plus n, the horizon, times the learning rate times the worst case possible value of the optimization problem on the previous slide. And then for various different games, you can bound what that worst case is. And here I'm just ignoring constants. So, so for full information, you get less than 1, and the corresponding regret bound is square root n log k, which is, is optimal. 
And, and similarly for bandits and linear bandits and graph bandits, we get the optimal thing. And then what you prove is that for locally observable games, the optimum is order one. So game dependent constants again, uh, but that gives you the end to one half for grab. And for globally observable games, you get order eta to the minus one half. And that ends up being n to the two thirds when we tune it. <clears throat> All right, I'm not going to go over this proof, but it's actually sort of completely trivial. And if you want to pause now, you can you can follow these steps yourself and, and convince yourself that this is this is simple. All right, so the basic ideas are for globally observable games, what you have to do is just add some uniform noise. So basically what we're doing here is we're looking to have a bound on this optq function. And the nice thing about this is <clears throat> in the analysis, you just need to upper bound it by something, but the algorithm can upper bound it by something that's much tighter. So very often the algorithm is going to do much better than the analysis suggests that you might. But if you just want a naive bound for globally observable games, what you're going to do is take the Q, mix it with uniform noise, and, and then you just run through the calculation. It's sort of very simple. And actually that mirrors exactly what's been done in the past for globally observable games. So the algorithm there would take exponential weights, would mix a, an appropriate amount of uniform exploration, and then optimize the scalar. But... The nice thing here is this algorithm is going to do everything automatically. So for example, if there's only one action that's informative, the algorithm is not going to play a sort of a uniform exploration distribution. It's going to play focusing on that, that action much more strongly. So for locally observable games, it's more complicated and, and much more interesting, and there's not enough time to, to give you the details, but the very high level perspective, which is, is generic is, is the first point is this psi q function is convex. And, and so in particular, its perspective is, is also convex. And, and what this allows us to do is to look at the optimization problem, which is a min over the P and also the, the G um, should be there as well. And then a max over the choices of the adversary. And, and now because this is convex in, in P and also convex in G, we can exchange these min and the max. So, so first we replace the max with a with an expectation, and and then we can exchange the min and the max using signs. And so now what we've done is we've converted the normal partial monitoring problem essentially into a Bayesian version, but it's local. It's within each in each time step. And so essentially now it's a much easier task because all you have to do is show that for every distribution that the adversary could choose over the outcomes we can find an exploration distribution and an estimation function g that makes this quantity small. And, and actually, we then do that in this paper by going back and looking at, at our paper last year at Colton using the exploration distribution provided there, essentially. All right, so there's lots of other stuff in this paper. Um, so one of the problems that we have at first is this, this optimization problem appears in the bound, and, and so tuning the learning rate should really depend on that. But actually, even though you can solve the optimization problem, you can't solve the optimization problem maxed over all Qs efficiently. Um, so the, the tuning the eta is not so easy, but actually we show that you can tune it online and everything is fine. Actually, you get an even better result. Okay, we show how to, to use this technique to get high probability bounds. Uh, the algorithm is going to be adaptive. So if the value of that optimization problem is, is small, in actual fact, for the choices that the adversary makes, then you get a better bound. Um, so it is a convex program, but it's an exponential cone program, which is numerically not the best. And so in the paper, we give a second order cone program approximation, which has all of the same theory associated with it, and it's just much better numerically. And you can solve it sort of using standard solvers. If you compare this thing to hedge, then you're going to see it's actually not the same. So if you apply it in the standard full information case, it's a little bit different. It's going to shift the losses, and, and actually it gets a slightly adaptive bound as a consequence of that. Um, okay, so I've ignored completely the constants here, but, but in the paper we give a sort of a much better understanding about what the constants look like, uh, although there's still plenty of open problems there. So I think it's it's pretty fascinating to understand still really the, the dependence of the regret on the constants. Okay, there's no particular reason you should restrict yourself to unbiased estimates, and actually the main algorithm would present 
optimizes over the bias as well. So you can do a sort of a bias variance trade-off as well. And you can also use other potential functions. So, so you don't have to use the neg entropy. All of this perspective convexity stuff still works. Um, and, and there's lots of open problems. So I, I hope you're excited and I hope to see you at the lecture.